Hello, and welcome to the Waves webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about Mastering with Waves, presented by Yoad Naveau. I'm going to hand things over now to our presenter for today's webinar. He's a London-based producer, mixer, and mastering engineer, and his work can be heard on best-selling, critically acclaimed releases by the likes of Brian Adams, Jem, Pet Shop Boys, Sugar Babes, and many others. He's also the author of the interactive course, Hit Record, and Inside Track to Music Production with Waves, and continues to lend his expertise as a Waves developer. He's one of the best we've got, so please welcome Yoad Nivo. Hello, and welcome to this uh, mastering webinar. Today we'll touch the subject of uh, mastering uh, in the digital domain. Uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the mastering work I do here at Nivo Mastering um, is based on analog gear as well as digital processing, but today we will discuss the digital side of things uh, using Waves plugins to master two songs that we have here. Um, basically, it's um, a song and a remix. Um, the song is by a band called These Raining Days and the song is called um, Living It Up. And we have, um, so we have the main version and we have a remix version, uh, remixed by Guy Rotem. Um, and uh, the reason I chose these two files is that they are very different, although it's the same song, but the arrangement and the sound is so different, so it will uh, make it easy for us to um, look at a few different uh, approaches to basically the, what used to be the same song. Um, as you can see on the screen, the main version, uh, which is the original production, um, which um, I did here uh, in the studio with a band. Uh, now, since I, I recorded and mixed it, I had the opportunity to record it quite hot for two reasons. One is that I wanted to um, have a lot of the color of the desk, of the Neve desk. Um, and I wanted to hit it hard, but the other reason is that I wanted to get a little bit of clipping on the A to D. Now, as you can see where it is clipped, um, it's only about 10 or 15 sam consecutive samples that are clipped, because if you get more than that, then it's audible. But this allows me to gain about half a dB to dB in level, before even starting the mastering process. So um, that's an opportunity that you get only when you actually mix the, um, the music yourself, because then you can control the, the exact amount of clipping you want to introduce. And that already makes it sound slightly louder um, than it would otherwise be without compromising on the sound too much. That's hear a little bit of the chorus so as you can see it's already very hot um, because of the a to d clipping the first thing i would like to do is basically bring the level down in order to have enough headroom to, um, to make other processing. Um, and I can do that using just uh, a Q1 EQ, um, where I just lower both channels by 6 dB. No processing here, so it's basically just a level plugin. Okay, so now I have a lot more headroom and I can experiment with some compression. Um, I really like using the SSL Master Bus Compressor because um, I used to mix a lot when um, uh, I used to work a lot on SSL desks and I really got used to that sound. Uh, I really like that and that's a really good modeling of that classic compressor. Um, now, the default preset is very basic and it's quite good, but what I like to do is to start from scratch and um, the, again, the reason why I lowered the gain 
before heating the compressor is that you see that even at the lower, uh, the lowest um, or the least sensitive threshold setting, it's still compressing. And had I not have the um, the, the Q10, it would be compressing quite a bit without me even setting the threshold. So I would like to have that kind of headroom. Um, and now I can play with the attack time. Uh, probably leave some of the original attack to, to come through because I don't want to, to make it too kind of um, dead. I want to have some punch on the drums. And then I can start playing with the threshold to get that sweet sound. I usually use the auto release on the SSL because it just sounds sounds great but it's a matter of taste uh, so I would probably try compressing something like 2 to 3 dB not more because I would like to keep the original dynamics of this track. Um, so that already kind of glues everything together in a very nice way um, and I'm quite happy with that. Just because it's a rock song I would like to try the CLA 2A although it's not um, usually a mastering compressor it does sound kind of cool um, because its processing is very slow because of the nature of the optical uh, circuitry of the original um, LA-2A, which uh, the CLA-2A is modeled on. Again, very slightly compress it. And uh, it's completely two different approaches because the, the SSL one makes everything, the SSL um, Master Bus compressor makes everything really poppy and kind of punchy and brings it closer whereas the um, the CLA-2A makes it more kind of wide slightly I like the stereo image it does something to the stereo image which I really like um, and what we can do is um, use the coloration and the stereo image um, from the CLA-2A so not really compressing but just going through it or maybe ever so slightly letting it hit the, the threshold and then use the SSL before it as well now for, for that we need to use a little bit of makeup gain on the SSL to keep it at the same level before it was compressing. As you can see, it's very, very gentle, uh, but it does give a lot of coloration to, to the sound in a very nice way. A good way of controlling the uh, very low frequencies is using the linear phase EQ, um, the low band, section of it and just putting a um, high pass filter at around I don't know 22 or maybe 32 Hertz just to keep it kind of within reason again if needed be and I would say this is pretty much what I would do to this track except for leveling so in order to get the level really loud on this track, I would use the L3. Um, the L3 basically is a very clever processor because what it does is it has five bands and it looks at the overall um, gain reduction by analyzing what happens in each band and um, basically you determine the overall threshold and how much do you want to uh, reduce the the overall gain and the processor goes and looks at the different bands and 
basically um, tries to make the least audible gain change on each band in order for it to provide the required uh, overall gain change. Um, so that's a very, very clever algorithm um, that we worked really, really hard uh, a couple of few years ago uh, to, uh, to develop. Let's see it in action. I tell it to compress about 2 dB. Now, as you can see, it will automatically try to compress where the most energy um, actually is. And I would like to keep this low mid, this low mid range, because there's the, the kick drum hits there and the bass guitar and some of the electric guitars as well. So there's a lot of punch going on there. But what I can do is I can tell it to compress more at the very uh, at the lowest band in order to preserve um, the, the gain structure of the low mid where it wants to compress. So I can give the low mid range more priority and less priority to the low range, to the low band. So the gain change is still the same, it's around 2 dB but it's structured differently, so it preserves the, uh, the energy in the low mid better. What I can do is slightly brighten the whole track by just adding gain to the top band, which starts at around 5k, but I can move it to maybe 6 or 7k, just to give it a little bit of brightness. You can already hear the keyboard and the uh, and the vocal getting slightly bright. That's probably too much. You can probably go for maybe half dB, 0.67. It sounds pretty good. So that really adds quite a lot of level. without affecting too much the, the, the overall sound, except um, the deliberate um, brightening up, um, on the, which is static, by the way, because it's just a game. This is pretty much done for this track. I can try to squeeze maybe another dB or two um, by using another L2 at the end and I'm using that for two reasons although I have the IDR section in the L3 I can switch it off by putting no dither so now it's switched off one thing I would like to say about dithering Dithering basically is there in order to mask uh, artifacts um, generated by quantization error, uh, which occurs whenever you do any sort of manipulation on uh, digital audio, whether it's level, pen, summing, EQing, compression. Everything that you do will involve calculations, which the result of will have to be rounded um, to the nearest bit. Uh, now, on, on mainly on, on high frequencies, that can, um, that can uh, generate some unpleasant artifacts because of the, uh, the cyclic nature of this uh, quantization error. Uh, and what we do by adding dither is we just um, masking those artifacts by applying just plain noise. Um, which will mask those artifacts, um, those artifacts because um, the noise obviously is random, so it won't allow any of the cyclic um, errors or error correct or sorry uh, quanti quantization errors to to be audible. Um, since we're using two analog modeling um, 
devices already, one is the SSL compressor and one is the CLA-2A, they already introduce noise because when we model them, we model the noise and the hum um, as low as it may be. I mean, it's at exactly the same level as it is on the original um, analog gear. So um, basically, this already gives us um, some noise floor which is probably sufficient so we don't really need to use any type of additional um, noise to mask the unwanted artifacts uh, so in this case I'm gonna leave the IDR off as well this is something to, to experiment with um, what I am going to do is to leave some headroom of about 0.2 dB which is totally uh, inaudible but uh, just to give it some headroom because on some CD players you'll have the peak uh, the peak meter uh, starting to, to to get active at around minus uh, 0 0.1 dB so I'm gonna avoid that and then I can see if I if I can squeeze any more level without it being audible If we look at the whole gain reduction in this chain, which will uh, tell us what the actual gain change that we are uh, generating, we will see minus 2.4 plus minus 1.4, which is uh, 3.8, which is pretty good. Uh, plus the, the clipping, the slight clipping that we had on the original uh, recording, which is about maybe half a dB to one dB. So it's altogether um, in the area of five, four and a half, five dB, which is which will make it pretty loud. We can now leave that song and move to the other song, which is again, it's the same song it's it's a remix which uh, obviously sounds completely different now there's plenty of headroom on this recording which is great uh, obviously this was uh, mixed in the box so there's no point in clipping the master um, in order to, to, to gain uh, any more level because we can do that in at, at any stage not necessarily at the ATD point because there isn't one really okay I'm not going to use any compression here but I am going to use the HEQ which will allow me to control the level of the kick drum in a very interesting way basically what the HEQ allows me to do is to work on the middle and on the side channel and I'm doing that by switching to MS mode here now what that allows me to do is to to treat everything that is in the center um, in one way and everything that is on the sides in a different way of processing so now I can control the color of the kick drum because it's in the center without changing the information that is on the sides at all which is brilliant because now I can just look at the low mid just on the center channel so you can hear that it boosts the fundamental around the fundamental note of the um, of the bass what I would like to do is try to lose some of the knock on the kick drum. So I'll go to around 2.5k. And I can just soften this range a little bit. At the same time I can add some low frequencies. I'll use a different type of band here. Just to make it a bit fatter. And then I can go to the side 
channel and add some pine needs which will not affect the kick at all even though it's the same frequency so that's very interesting because then it allows me to lift the synths and the pads and make it kind of wider and more majestic um, a very important thing to remember is that mastering is not mixing so we, we shouldn't really change the nature of the or the sort of composition of the track too much um, I think you know I, tr I I'm being very very careful when I master um, because I would like I, I try to preserve the the essence of the original recording um, as much as possible and just make it sounding better on different playback systems make it louder make it wider um, but not applying too much um, creative creativeness really but it's it's a very technical process it's the sum of my 26 years of experience um, kind of squeeze into half a dB here half a dB there and that's that's what it is really um, so now I kind of got a feel of where I can go with this track now I'm going to tame my processing by a lot so I know that those pads kind of sound nice it kind of makes it wide now I can still like the, the cut on the kick drum at around two and a half K I can try another EQ which is narrower it's a different type of EQ I like this one this kind of makes it nice and punchy now since this is a remix, I don't think um, it needs um, it needs compression at all because, as you can see, there's not much dynamic here. The kick drum basically governs the whole um, dynamic structure of the track, which is very solid. Um, but what I can use is um, the MPX tape just to give it immediately as you put it in it gives it uh, this amazing warmth and kind of width which I really like um, I can experiment with the bias setting maybe it's too hot on the over bias and maybe I can just get it normal I actually like it like that because again it softens that point on the, on the kick drum in a way that I kind of like so I'm quite happy with that. Now we can go um, to just boosting the level. And let's do that with the L2 and see where that, that takes us. So easily. Now you see, if I do it too much, then the whole track kind of gets squashed and it's horrible. But if I get like 2, two dB, well that sounds fine. Now since this is not the last plugin in the chain, I can keep it at 24 bit. And then what I like to do is to try the L3 after the L2. Because then what will happen is the L2 will because it's wideband, it, it applies to the whole frequency range. It will kind of narrow the dynamic range of the, of the peaks. And that will allow me to control the different frequencies in a less dynamic way. So they're already closer together. The kick um, and the snare and the vocal are now tighter together because of the L2 and now I can sculpture the low frequencies a little bit more so again I can give a lower priority to, 
to the low frequency, but I can give a much lower priority to the mid range. And then we will compress the kick. But as you can see, it touches mainly just the kick. And that kind of makes the whole thing uh, glued together. Um, so now we can check the two tracks back to back to see if they fit on the same CD or compilation. So this is a bit misleading because the, the balance of the vocal within each mix is so different, although it's the same song. Um, Usually it's a good uh, reference point to, to, to listen to the vocal, especially if it's a, if it's a, a, a band um, or, or a singer. Uh, but in this case, the remix, the vocal is, so, is mixed so low, and that's cool because that's just the way it is. It's more about the kick and the drive rather than the, the lyrics. Um, so we have to, to try to imagine it uh, and to try to check it on different uh, speakers at different levels in order to, to make sure that both tracks are at the same level. So I listen to the, obviously to the loudest part of each song. In this case, it doesn't really matter but here. So I can see that the remix is slightly too low in comparison to the main version. So I'll try to give it a bit, another notch on the L2. Now what I also I'm also hearing is that the I don't really like the high frequencies that I added here anymore. So I'm going to lose that. But what I am going to do is use the um, just make room here for. To insert another plugin, which will be the Q clone. The Q clone allows me to uh, create a convolution filter in real time based on an analog um, EQ that is connected to it. Um, so now it's connected. It's going through a channel of my uh, my Neve, uh, and I really like the sound of this EQ. As and as you can see, as I turn the knobs on the Neve, the, um, the EQ updates um, in real time and that's great. And what we see here, we see a little bit of cut at the low frequencies and this is because of the transformer of the desk and this is a part of the sound of the desk. I can try to compensate for this just to make it more flat. Um, but I kind of like that sound and you can see a little ripple here at the high frequencies that's again that's part of the of the of the sound of this amazing desk but what I would like to do is to add a little bit of top this sweet top maybe a little bit of timing just to make it more punchy now that sounds sweet to me. Um, like I said, usually I would try to um, to use both analog and digital processes. In this case, like I said before, it's only the digital processing that we're using today. So I'm kind of bringing the sweetness of this um, analog EQ into the uh, the digital domain in in a very unique way. And this is what the Q clone. Um, allows us to do um, and again it's not the actual signa signal that is going through the Q-clone because if you hear what the Q-clone is listening to it sounds like that it's basically a sweep over all the frequencies every 400 milliseconds and then it measures uh, if there's no processing or no change in the filter then it will come back as flat and there will be no consequence on the Q clone but 
since there is manipulation on the frequency curve, then this is what we see, and this is what's been captured by the Q-clone, and can be um, transformed into a plug-in format, which can obviously be saved with the session. So that's a very, very flexible tool. Um, maybe slightly too bright. These are very, very tiny steps that I'm applying here. What I can also try is lose the high, high pass filter and try the desk high pass filter, which is really cool. Um, sounding. very gently. Once I'm happy with that, I just press hold and this is now the EQ of this song. Let's go back to the other song. Now they sound much more similar back to back. Um, so this was a very, very uh, kind of rapid tour into what we can do um, in the digital domain. I think that uh, as a rule of thumb, um, you know, I never have one method of processing uh, masters. Uh, I would first, my first choice would be the, the analog gear and the, the selection of nice bits of gear that I have here in the rack. Um, but then I would use the, the Waves plugins as well. Um, in terms of leveling, that would be done either in the A to D stage if we have the opportunity of doing that and um, since uh, the majority uh, I would say 99% of the mastering uh, jobs that I get are in form of, uh, of files which are already digital uh, and then I run them through the analog gear that allows me to have another go at trying to clip the A to D on the way back to the system um, so I have that opportunity again and that allows me to run it through the A to D going back to the system and uh, allows me to, to use a little bit of A to D clipping. But again it depends on the style and it depends on the type of music, uh, whether it's live, whether it's kind of more rocky or more pop. On classical music I would uh, never dream of doing anything like that because I would keep everything as kind of clean as uh, as possible so every every song gets uh, its own sort of chain and uh, and I try to, to treat every song and just to individually and just to make it as amazing as it can possibly sound um, and again only with very very gentle uh, movements. Um, if you have to EQ more than like 2-3 dB then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, and the same goes to compression. I hardly use compression uh, in mastering and if I do it would be more in terms of coloring the, the picture rather than trying to change the internal dynamics. Um, in this, in this case, in the case of the of the remix, I, I I did more of that because I felt that the kick was too prominent, especially in the area of like two three k, and I wanted to tame that a little bit. But also that was because I wanted it to match um, another recording, which was a live band playing in the studio and the, the two worlds are so different that I, I wanted to, to bring them close together so that kind of allowed me the, the freedom to to manipulate it a little bit more than I would otherwise um, do. Um, so th my main uh, sort of advice or or kind of comment would be that it's a very very delicate process and uh, it should be done with extreme care 
Um, I think that mastering shows the the experience, and it's really the peak and the the, the sum of your total experience in the field of of sound. Um, and um, it's the last stage before of pressing or before uploading um, the tracks or the album, uh, whatever format it is, um, and it makes it very, very important, uh, but very exciting as well at the same time.